Pints with Jack, Season 3, Episode 27. After Hours with Dr. Stephen Beebe. Good morning and welcome to Pints with Jack, a podcast where two enthusiastic C.S. Lewis amateurs get together, share a beverage and discuss a work of C.S. Lewis. And this season we're reading Till We Have Faces. But today is one of our After Hours episodes and today I'm joined by Dr. Stephen Beebe, whom Matt and I met at the conference in North Carolina at the end of last year. He's just released a new book entitled C.S. Lewis and the Craft of Communication. So, to give a little bit of background, Dr. Stephen Beebe is Regents and University Distinguished Professor of Communication Studies. He served as Chair of the Department of Communication Studies for 28 years and Associate Dean of the College of Fine Arts and Communication for 25 years. Dr. Beebe has been a visiting scholar at both Oxford and Cambridge University. He teaches courses that focus on communication skill development. He also teaches a course both at Texas State and Oxford University titled C.S. Lewis. Chronicles of a Master Communicator, and it's inspired by a manuscript he discovered that was the partial opening chapter of a book that was to be co-authored between J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis called Language and Human Nature. Dr. Beebe, welcome to Pints with Jack. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Me too. And here at Pints with Jack, we always have a drink of the week and quote of the week. So today I'm drinking Benchmark, which is Old Eight brand Kentucky whiskey. Ah. Are you drinking anything? Water is allowed. I'm having it since it's about tea time here in Texas. Uh, I'm drinking uh, some PG Tips tea today. PG Tips is an excellent choice. I commend you in that. It's been really nice. Quite a few of my guests recently, they've been going for all of my favorite tea brands. <laughs> it's my favorite. And I understand Lewis liked Thai food brand. That was his brand, but I couldn't find that, but I can find PG Tips. So that's what I'm having. <laughs> it's right up there next to it. Yeah. Uh, now, before we toast, uh, we always have a quote of the week. And this comes from Rejoinder to Dr. Pittinger. And it's from the essay collection, God in the Dock. When I began... Christianity came before the great mass of my unbelieving fellow countrymen, either in the highly emotional form offered by revivalists, or in the unintelligible language of highly cultured clergymen. Most men were reached by neither. My task was therefore simply that of a translator, one turning Christian doctrine, or what he believed to be such, into the vernacular, into language that unscholarly people would attend to and understand. So with that, cheers. Cheers. So, Dr. Beebe, before we talk about your new book, can you please tell us a little bit more about yourself and how you became interested in the subject of communication? I can. I'm uh, happy to do that. And you've captured a lot of the the sort of descriptions and titles. Um, I thought I was going to be a music major and ended up in communication. And both the, sometimes people say, well, what is the connection between music and communication? Well, they're both about performance. They're both about human expression. I thought I might be a high school music teacher, but as I continued to take communication courses, I was fascinated by communication and public speaking, and uh, so became uh, uh, first got my master's, and I thought, well, if if this works out all right, uh, I'll get my doctorate and see if there's an opportunity for an academic life, And, and that is what happened. So. Uh, I started teaching. I spent the first 10 years of my career at the University of Miami in Coral Gables, Florida. And then I've been at Texas State where I just retired last year. So uh, I I was at Texas State on the faculty for 33 years. And now I'm trying to figure out uh, what retirement's about and how to do that. (laughs) Uh, Improve your golf swing. Well, I don't play golf. I'm, I'm not sure I would get very high grades in retirement. I've content with the, this book uh, on C.S. Lewis and uh, some other writing projects. So I've kept relatively busy. I still do some speaking for corporations and businesses. So I've kept busier than all, the stack of books that I thought I was sure would plow through. Um, I'm making a little dent in them, but uh, <laughs> I still have work to do. Well, then let's talk about C.S. Lewis. When were you first introduced to him? It was almost uh, 30 years ago this month, when I say it was exactly 30 years ago this month, that my family and I first were on a bus tour and we stopped in Oxford just for about 45 minutes. 
and I was just captivated by Oxford. At that time, 30 years ago, I had not read a single word of C.S. Lewis. I knew who Lewis was. I knew he, I'd heard him quoted in sermons, and he was someone kind of hovering around that would periodically be quoted, and people would go, ah. Um, <laughs> so I knew about him. I really didn't hadn't read any of Lewis. I didn't read the Narnia Chronicles as a kid, uh, but I went to Oxford and fell in love with Oxford. And after being there for 45 minutes in a cool, drizzling rain, <laughs> and I said, I need to find a way to come back here. And I did. In 1993, I took my two sons and my wife and we had an adventure and we spent a term in Oxford. And while there, it was in March, I believe, while I was there on another cold, dreary day, I said, I think I think C.S. Lewis, uh, I think he lived in Oxford. Maybe I should learn a little bit more about that. So I picked up a biography of C.S. Lewis. It happened to be a N. Wilson's biography of C.S. Lewis, and some people uh, <laughs> had some concerns and questions about that. Of course, I didn't know that at the time, because I didn't know anything about C.S. Lewis, other than that, would, that biography had just come out. And, uh, and even though there are some uh, issues people have with that book, the basic facts, the basic trajectory of Lewis's life, as uh, described in that biography, are true. And it was really Lewis himself. I just thought, what an interesting person. Uh, the, the relationship with Joy Davidman and getting married technically and then married again and living in Oxford and his and J.R.R. Tolkien. I mean, it's just the whole package of an interesting person to study. Uh, and that's when I thought, well, maybe I should read something by Lewis if I'm interested in it. <laughs> so I did. When I got back to the States, I uh, just started reading a bit about Lewis and found that, uh, at least from my lens as a communication professor, Lewis had a lot to say about communication and about language and about words and about meaning. And I, there was a study group here near where I live here, near Austin, Texas. And it was a wonderful, in fact, they're still meeting, a wonderful group of people. And uh, we would pick a Lewis book and read it and come together each month and talk about it. And I was involved actively with that group for five or six years. And there were several individuals, uh, Joel Heck, for example, a well-published Lewis scholar and author, uh, George Musashio, again, a very well-known Lewis published author. They were very patient with me <laughs> as I was just learning Lewis. And, and I keep saying, did you see this about language? Did you see this about communication? And they'd kind of go, yeah, yeah, Steve, yeah, okay. let's, <laughs> talk about the let's talk about this and so forth. Um, and so I had another sabbatical in 2002. And I thought, okay, I'm going to make a study of this. I'm going to really see what I can find. And my uh, idea was, let me go to the Bodleian Library and just look at original Lewis manuscripts and treat them almost as looking for clues. What could I find about the way Lewis communicated? Could I learn something about his thought process by seeing what he crossed out, by seeing what he was going to write but didn't write but then ended up writing and I knew his manuscripts were there, so uh, so I went to the library and started checking out books, and I was very disappointed because uh, C.S. Lewis didn't cross out much. I mean, there are some edits and some uh, changes, but when he wrote something down, he uh, had already thought about it. And he, by the time he put it to paper, he had uh, spoken it out loud and then put it on paper, uh, and so I was... I was disappointed with my research idea. I was going to look at the classical canon of invention and to see how did Lewis come up with ideas and approach it that way. But it was while sort of randomly picking out things to uh, to read, I came across this little orange paper covered notebook. And I started reading this uh, beginning. He says, in a book like this, we should begin with the origins of language and continued and i said i don't remember any of lewis's books starting that way before i said that's not how studies and words started and i sort of said what what is this uh and it was about eight pages of lewis's uh, manuscript in his handwriting which is a little tricky to read and uh, charlie star calls it villainous handwriting and it is and so i said well I, I, I this seems to be about language and words and communication something i'm very interested in uh i'm sure it's published and so i set about to find it um, there I was in Oxford and had the, all of the resources of the Bodleian Library, and I couldn't find it. And so, and I didn't know what it was. I just thought it was a little fragment of something, but I, I knew it was about language. So I started about the task of transcribing it. And it took me almost three years of coming and going back to Oxford before I could finally say, I think I understand what this is, because uh, as you probably know, you can't check anything out of the Bodleian Library. Mm -hmm. 
Not even the queen can check anything out of it. <laughs> and I still didn't know what it was. And I showed it to some of my Lewis friends. By that time, I had met uh, Walter Hooper, who was very kind and generous, and Michael Ward, and uh, also Jerry Root, uh, who I know has been a, a speaker. Uh, I got an email one day out of the blue saying, would you be interested in being a supervisor for Jerry Root, who's finishing his doctorate? at uh, Oxford Center for Mission Studies. I did not know Jerry. Uh, I didn't know anything in that. I was just beginning my Lewis studies. Why would they ask me? And I found out Jerry had published about Lewis. And so I said, of course, I'd, I'd do that. And so that friendship also was another piece of beginning to learn and see Lewis had some things to say about language and rhetoric and communication. Uh, so between 2002 and 2009, I would trudge back and forth. And I got an idea for teaching a course about Lewis, both at the Texas State University campus and then in Oxford. Uh, but it wasn't until 2009, seven years after I had originally read the manuscript, I was uh, our, our washing machine had broken. And so I just grabbed a random book off the shelf. And my wife, Sue, said, we've got to go do our laundry. Okay. And so we were sitting there watching our laundry, and I was reading a book I'd read before, Diana Glyer's excellent book, The Company They Keep. Mm -hmm. I was sitting there, and I'd read it before, but then when I got to page 146, and she started writing about, and Lewis and Tolkien were going to write this book called Language and Human Nature, and it was going to be at words. It was never published, and, and most folks don't say, and it was sort of like, I just stopped when I read that sentence, and it just clicked. And I remember sitting there watching my uh, laundry tumble in the dryer, and I just shouted out, I know what it is. And uh, <laughs> my kind wife kind of, what are you talking about? And I just kind of paused, and I said, I know what this manuscript is. It is uh, the manuscript that C.S. Lewis was going to write with J.R.R. Tolkien called Language and Human Nature. And these are the opening pages that Lewis did write. And... Um, Swiftly had it confirmed by some others, uh, Lewis scholars. And from there, an idea for a book about Lewis really began about that time, even before that time. I was based on the course that I taught. But it was sort of unlocking that key uh, to Lewis. It was the evidence I needed. My suspicion was and is uh, C.S. Lewis should be considered, among other things, a professor of communication in addition to medieval and Renaissance literature and other kinds of things. But I argue that Lewis had a lot to say about communication, so much, in fact, that he and J.R.R. Tolkien were going to write a book about it. Uh, Tolkien never began it, and there's no evidence that he did. Uh, in fact, there's some correspondence from Lewis grumbling about, I suppose, my book with Professor Tolkien will never be written that uh, unmethodical, dilatory man, he said. Uh, <laughs> But Lewis did begin it and tucked it away in this notebook, and that it just continued to unfold and confirm C.S. Lewis can teach us something about communication. And that's the tiny little light that I have as someone who studied communication for the last three or four decades. Well, I wonder what I can sort of, what lens, using my lens of communication, can I, can I compile and identify what Lewis had to say about communication? And, and throughout this journey, I continued to read Lewis and continued to find so many references to language and words and meaning. And of course, he wrote books like Studies in Words and Before We Can Communicate and The Language of Religion. But as you put them together, you see Lewis was very interested and quite talented in his insights about what you and I are doing in this moment and what others are doing as they listen to us, how we make sense out of the world and share that sense with others through language and words and meaning. Um, so that's, that's the tiny little light that I bring to Lewis studies as I uh, have had a wonderful time identifying, cataloging, and organizing Lewis's principles of communication. Wonderful. So let's then talk about the, the book, which was the fruit of all of this. It's called C.S. Lewis and the Craft of Communication. And the blurb on the back of it says, C.S. Lewis, based on the popularity of his books and essays, is one of the best communicators of the 20th century. During his lifetime, he was hailed for his talents as author, speaker, educator, and broadcaster. He continues to be a best-selling author more than half a century after his death. C.S. Lewis and the Craft of Communication analyzes Lewis's communication skill, a comprehensive review of Lewis's works reveal five communication principles that explain his success as a communicator. 
And you've got some wonderful endorsements here from a bunch of C.S. Lewis folks, Walter Hooper, Jay Root, Michael Ward, Diana Glyer, Andrew Lazo, Will Vowles. And we'll, we'll get onto those communication principles in a bit. But before that, can you just talk us through the structure of your book? I can. I really wrote the book. One of the things Lewis taught about communication was make sure you focus on your audience. And so my audience is really anyone who's interested in C.S. Lewis, whether you're a Lewis scholar or new to C.S. Lewis. Uh, really, what makes C.S. Lewis C.S. Lewis? Why is he so popular? And my argument in the book is that he is so popular because of the way he communicated, that he connects with people that there are Lewis societies, C.S. Lewis podcasts. There are lots of people who are interested in learning from and about C.S. Lewis. And so I argue that uh, my chapter one is called uh, The Case for C.S. Lewis as a Master Communicator. It's sort of like, why, how do you put Lewis and communication together? That's, that's easy for me to do because that was my profession. <laughs> uh, but why should anyone else be interested or think that Lewis has anything to say about communication? And I make three arguments in chapter one to say, what, what, why this book and what evidence do you have, Steve, that Lewis had something to say? Argument number one is one you've already alluded to. Lewis was a popular communicator. He has sold and continues to sell, and I predict will sell, millions of copies. Uh, but there are lots of people who write lots of books who are very popular. That doesn't necessarily make them knowledgeable about communication. Well, that leads me to my second argument of why Lewis and communication. Not only did he communicate in ways that people want to learn about what he said, but uh, he was also a, a, a practitioner of communication. That's what he did for a living. What he did for a living was he wrote, he spoke, he taught. He was a communicator by profession. That he was a professional communicator. Uh, there again, there are lots of people who are popular, and they might be an English literature professor, and so they work with words, and you could say lots of people do that. What really makes Lewis such an expert or knowledgeable that we should cull through what he has to say about communication? And that's my third and I think clinching point about why Lewis and communication. And that is he professed principles of communication. He was what I call a meta communicator. He communicates about communication. He tells you what he's doing. Not only does he do it, but he masterfully will tell you, here's how to connect with people. In the course that I teach, uh, C.S. Lewis and the Chronicles of a Master Communicator, uh, I give my students, as most faculty do, a detailed syllabus. And uh, the first day of class, I also give them the final exam. The final exam is a take-home exam that consists of two questions. And those two questions form the goals of the course. Question number one is, what did C.S. Lewis say about communication? What were his principles of communication that you can glean as you're reading Lewis? Even before you pick up a book about Lewis, what can you, can you be attuned to what he said? And the second question on the final exam that I want them to be able to tell me when the course is over is, what did C.S. Lewis do that made him an effective communicator? What are his techniques? What are things uh, not only that he did, but that you and I could do as well? And so writing this book uh, means I can never teach my class again because <laughs> I've just given my students the answers to the final exam questions. So in some ways, now that I'm retired, I feel like I can publish the answer to my final exam. <laughs> and uh, so the book in chapter one says, Lewis should be considered for his skill as a communicator. And there's lots of evidence of that. He was popular. He was professional. And he was a professor of communication. And uh, that sets the stage for where the rest of the book goes. And then you go on and you talk about how he how he reached that point. What was it that shaped him to be able to be such a good communicator? I did. And some people, you know, the, the Lewis scholars probably don't need to read my chapter two or chapter three. They might want to to see if Steve got it right. But chapter two is called The Making of a Master Communicator. And I wanted to, there are lots of biographies and lots of summaries of Lewis's life and what he did. What I do in chapter two is particularly focus on what were uh, 
elements and experiences in his background that made him an effective communicator. Um, what was it about his home life? What was it about his education? What was it about his friends, about his colleagues? Uh, and so I, I, it, it's a one chapter summary of Lewis's life, but with an eye again toward communication. What made him this way? What are his experiences? And so it would be uh, once I looked at Lewis's life from that perspective, it was like, um, of course, he would know something about communication, given all that he studied and all that he wrote. He didn't take he, – he would not, even though he called himself a rhetorician, a congenital rhetorician, he would probably be surprised that you and I are having this conversation and, and, and that I'm – here's this communication professor nominating him as a communication professor. The discipline of communication, the National Communication Association, the oldest and largest communication association in the world, uh, was founded about 1914, just about the time Lewis was beginning his education. Mm -hmm. Even today in England, if you take courses at Oxford and Cambridge, yes, you can take courses in rhetoric, part of the uh, initial trivium, uh, but they're really not packaged as communication courses. Uh, and, and so Lewis would probably be uh, surprised and he might want to use his dialectical skills to debate me to say, oh, no, don't consider me that way. But I, I think um, I'm not sure with Lewis I'd win any argument. But if I <laughs> I'd like to think that I could argue w with Professor Lewis that he knew something about communication. Uh, so chapter two takes people through that. And then I thought for, again, chapter three, what did Lewis communicate about? So people who know Lewis and understand Lewis may or may not need to read chapter three. But I wanted, again, with a lens of communication, what were the big themes of his communication? What did he talk about? But my, my book is more about how did he communicate? What did he do and what did he say about communication that uh, ultimately leads to the punchline? What I say in the preface of my book, that, yes, this is a course and a book about C.S. Lewis, but it's a course about you and me, what can you and I learn about communication? How can reading about C.S. Lewis help and enhance your relationships with others? How can it help and enhance the way you talk, whether you're giving a speech, whether you're working in a group project? Uh, what can Lewis teach us? And so the last chapter of my book, as I take folks through the, the five principles, are how to communicate like C.S. Lewis. What can you do? So the last chapter gives folks a, a bushel basket full of 15 specific techniques, three for each of the five principles that say, here's some practice. It's sort of the textbook author in like me that, that had to come out because that's what I do. I write uh, communication textbooks. But sort of like if, if C.S. Lewis were to write a communication textbook, what would he teach us based upon what he said about communication? So that's the last chapter to send folks forth with, here's some things you can do so that you too can uh, emulate Lewis's communication prowess. It's funny because I, I do do talks on scripture, church history, apologetics, evangelization, and I've noticed my style change over the years, the more Lewis that I've read. In particular, I think the most major thing is I use analogies far more liberally than I ever did before. If I want to teach something, okay, I need to come up with a picture to put in people's heads. That's one of the five principles. And uh, when I started this journey and when I finally figured out what my manuscript was, and, and even before that, I had been looking at what Lewis said about communication. I started by just simply any time I found that Lewis made a comment about language, words, meaning, communication, I would write it down and put it in a file. Any time in a biography or a secondary source about C.S. Lewis, I found someone else making an observation about Lewis and communication or how Lewis used words or how he expressed himself, I put that in a file. I did not begin with saying, okay, I'm looking for Lewis's five principles. Or I'm trying to find out. I just thought, let me first gather some data. And so I spent uh, several years, seven or eight years, just reading Lewis, typing up what he said, making underlines and reading biographies. George Sayers' biography was especially helpful in uh, that regard because he knew Lewis and had very personal observations about Lewis and his relationships with others. And it was after that, it was, again, it was after I figured out what that manuscript was and I had my stack of, here's what Lewis said, that I said, okay, how do I make sense out of this? What seems to emerge? And what emerged were five principles, five baskets of ideas 
Uh, and so there's a chapter for each one of those principles. And so the, the book takes people through those principles one at a time using uh, Lewis's words and examples. So Lewis is really, I, I want Lewis to be the teacher, not Professor Beebe. Uh, I'll, I'll add my textbook voice at the end, but I really want it to be a book from lessons uh, from C.S. Lewis. What did he say? And so it has lots of quotations from Lewis, but organized in such a way that they lead you to identify what did he do? What, what are the things he did? And I argued that there were five big ideas. Now, underneath those five big ideas, there's lots of lots of ornaments you can hang on the tree, but five things. And I've organized it into five words. And the words, um, both on the back of the book, and you'll find on the table of contents, that I argued that Lewis was holistic, intentional, transpositional, evocative, and audience-centered. At the time I came up with those, it wasn't necessarily in that order. But as I looked at them and started coming up, hmm, I wonder if I can uh, make an acronym out of this to help me. <laughs> I, I, I need all the help I can get. As And so uh, it, it's not by accident that I chose as my beverage some tea this afternoon because – Holistic, intentional, transpositional, evocative, and audience-centered is the acronym for high tea. <laughs> so I join you this afternoon with some tea as we, and of course, Lewis loved tea. He loved having a big cup of tea with a long book, as Walter has told us. Is it too cute? I don't know, but it helps me remember them. <laughs> and so if somebody says high tea, you might not remember the concept of holistic or intentional but I think together, if you can all, all you can remember about C.S. Lewis in communication is high T. You will remember five powerful principles that you can use as you communicate, as you, whether you're trying to interpret uh, till we have faces. Now, there's a book that I understand people are interested in learning something about or mm -hmm. Christianity or one of the Narnia Chronicles. What I suggest is that Lewis use these principles in everything that he wrote about. It's not just in, and he said these, the principles that I've identified and use Lewis's language to document them. It's not just in one source or two sources, but you can find them scattered throughout the corpus of Lewis's work. It took me a while to do that. And I didn't start trying to find them. They sort of emerged through the mists as I sat back and said, what, what do we have here? So those five principles are sort of the core of the book with the final chapter on application. Before we touch a little bit on, on each of those principles, I'm curious because the, the most that I've read about Lewis when he's talking about writing is when he's talking about writing for children. Do you find that the principles that you drew out are equally applicable given that audience? I do. And of course, Lewis wrote his children's quote unquote books for adults as well, mm. which gets to the notion of there are some fundamental principles of how we connect to other human beings. Yes, there are different levels of maturation and knowledge of vocabulary that comes with age, but the underlying way you and I make sense, whether we're five or 105, these principles of Lewis, I think, are applicable. And some of these principles he, he wrote about, when, and it was really the children who would often ask him, so tell me, how, to, how, how can I be a better communicator? Some of his most classic and uh, uh, clear ideas about communication come from children who've said, how, how can I communicate better? What should I do? Uh, and many of those you've seen on the internet. And what I try to do in those, some, some has a list of 10 things, 14 things, eight things. What I suggest is there's an architecture of five principles that can help us remember and emulate Lewis. So yes, uh, for... Uh, applicable to children of all ages. Yeah. <laughs> okay. In that case, let's let's just touch on each of them as much as or as little as you would like to say. We want to make sure everyone goes out and buys the book. You know, I hope I'm I'm. Um, it's not exactly nervous, but maybe just a little bit. I've been sitting with these ideas, David, for 15 years, some of them, and actively working on this book for the last uh, 10 years. And I've talked about these in my classes, and I've given a few talks here and there, but they really haven't been widely published or distributed, and, and so it's not that I've tried to make them a secret necessarily. So I'm going to be really interested in the feedback, whether people say, oh, yeah, Steve, we knew all that all the way. There's, there's nothing here, or, hmm, that gives me something to think about. I'll just say it gave me something to think about. And mm -hmm. so I offer them as 
uh, again, my tiny little light. There's so many people who know so much more about C.S. Lewis than I do. I am a Lewis fan who've come to Lewis late in life. Uh, yes, I've now read the Narnia Chronicles uh, that I hadn't read when I was a kid. Glad to hear it. Several times and uh, have the very, very bad habit of collecting Lewis first editions. I watched a video of you giving a presentation about Lewis and you seem to have first editions that were signed for pretty much every book that you talked about. You know, that's a very, very bad habit, but it's just become um, part of what I'm most curious about. And people collect first editions, I understand, from those who sell first editions. Uh, I'm not trying to resell them or make money, and, and even though some of them are valuable, and I keep the most valuable ones, I keep in a safety deposit box and uh, do share them with as I give talks and show them with others. But it's just a way to can connect with this master communicator. And it's a way when I can show a signed book to students or I can show a signed letter to students. It's a way of making this community. This is not just another dead white guy that we're talking about. This is a real person who lived. And even today, through the power of communication, his ideas are alive. And we, we still want to make sense out of them by talking about them and getting other people to talk about them and have, as I say, talks and podcasts and conferences and Lewis study groups because it's still happening. And he knew how to do that. And so that's, I'm, I'm eager and interested to see how people respond to the ideas I have about communication. Wonderful. So what do you mean when you say that Lewis was holistic? Holistic? Uh, it took me a while to sort of, that, that basket of label. There are three pieces to being holistic. I suggest Lewis wrote for the eye and the ear. And that's well known. People know about that. There's a, a, but that's one of the factors, I think, that makes him effective. One of the things that makes Mere Christianity the number one ranked book of the 20th century of all Christian books published is because he has this way of connecting conversationally. And there's a technique of writing and speaking. So that's one factor of it. Uh, another element that others have talked about, but it's also part of being holistic, he combined and fused reason and imagination, not just in separate projects, but what I found and what he talks about is you do that sometimes in the same sentence, as he will imaginatively make a wonderful alliterative allegory to help make a reasonable point that he's making. He does them at the same time. So he's holistic mm. in that it's not just, yes, we know Lewis the logician and was a great debater and argument. We have those lot, but he's he puts them together. He's holistic. And the third element that I talk about in chapter four on whole, being holistic is that often we talk about the academic subjects of rhetoric, dialectic, and the poetic in separate academic departments and separate traditions. Rhetoric, you'll find courses in rhetoric both in communication departments and in English departments. Uh, and sometimes those colleagues don't talk much to each other. They both sort of say, no, we approach rhetoric. No, we approach. But yet, uh, and dialectic, that's primarily going to be found on college campus in the debate team. They're the folks that are interested in teach argument, debate. That's a, a subject. Uh, poetic, the aesthetic the perception and pursuit of beauty, we pretty much let our English literature colleagues pursue that and talk about poetry. And uh, of course, Lewis began his career wanting to be uh, a mere poet. What I suggest is that where today in academia, we chisel those up and say, well, you, you major in this and you major in this and you go over here and study this, Lewis put them all together. Mm. Saw no dividing line. In fact, he talks about it. There is no difference between uh, rhetoric and the poetic, he says, explicitly. Uh, and so I think that's, a, that's an insight that I realized when I saw him making those statements. Appealing to the eye and the ear, others have noted that. Reason and imagination, that has been around as long as people have been studying Lewis. That's a, a very classic way of approaching Lewis. Seeing how he combines the academic traditions, and not surprisingly, Lewis was an academic, so, uh, but to combine those, rhetoric, dialectic, and the poetic together in the same work, in the same process, to, to use, he never stopped wanting to be a poet. And so those skills of crafting just the right word to create colorful mental explosion in the middle of a sentence, he never stopped doing that. And so he was interested in holistically 
one of the one of the things that makes C.S. Lewis C.S. Lewis is he was holistic. I think that's definitely very true for Till We Have Faces, as we've been going through that this season. There's a reason and emotion just littered throughout it. As you're trying to work out what's actually happening here, and you're trying to reason it out at the same time, he's toying with your emotions and trying to draw you up to the mountain with Psyche. He is, and he's doing that in a conversational way, because as he wrote those words, David, he said them out loud. He didn't just think those words. He said he wanted to hear how they say. He was very interested in the sounds of words. He was also making a point. This was not Lewis. Uh, he was quite intentional, which, by the way, is principle number two. Uh, <laughs> he had a point he was making. And so until we have faces. Now, principle number two, the I of high T, I argue that Lewis was very clear that Lewis knew where he was taking you. Uh, however, sometimes... He didn't tell you where he was taking you. He knew. He knew what was happening. And so sometimes it's later on. We all, oh, and that's, that's which gets to being evocative that I'll talk about as principle four. But the intentionality of Lewis, Lewis over and over again in his writing, be clear. Know what you want to say. And until we have faces, sometimes you look at that and go, what? What is that about and what? So give me a, a Cliff's Notes version to help me. And I, I know some of your authors have looked at that. And my good friend, Andrew Lazo, is, is, uh, we're all anticipating his insights, any insights that he has. What a scholar and what a wonderful friend is Andrew. But And so we sometimes need these guides on the side to help us, but mm. Lewis had an intention. But he didn't necessarily want you to know right away that Oriel was not always the most truthful in her perceptions, but, um, but he knew. So as, as a communicator, it wasn't, well, let me just sit down and write and kind of see what happens and see what unfolds here. I suggest, because he suggests over and over again, be clear know what you want to say. And he tells you how to be clear. He says, you know, if you've ever said to someone, you know, I know what I want to say. I just can't, I just can't put it into words. Then Lewis would say, then you don't know what you want to say. Hmm. He would say, you need to think about it a bit more before you try to whack at it with some words. Uh, you need to be intentional. It was really the, in the, the manuscript that I identified, uh, the language and human nature. It's one of the fullest definitions of language in any of his writings. And what interested me about that was that he talked about being intentional, that language is a system of intentionally using spoken messages to mean something. So he was very he was very intentional, even as he thought about it. And nobody knew about that until 2010, when it was finally published in the journal article 7, as I shared my transcription with others. But uh, Lewis knew about it. He always knew where he was taking you, even though he didn't always tell you. So there's something about knowing that you can be comfortable with C.S. Lewis. If you're, if you're confused at the moment, don't worry. He'll he'll reveal it. He'll 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 get there. He knows where he's taking you. Are we there yet? He knows. He has set the GPS. He knows where he's taking you. He does that with such skill. He's such a master at using words. We have so many of his students who'd say he would just pick apart a specific word. Why are you using that word? Not only did he talk about clarity, but in that chapter I talk about his skill in being brief. Sometimes there are, as the emperor said to Mozart, there are too many notes. Uh, but Lewis wanted to make sure, let's, not, let's have just the right notes so that the melody is clear. And Lewis is among the most quotable, the quotable Lewis that my friend Jerry and Wayne Martindale have written about. Or William O'Flaherty's excellent work in helping us make sure we're quoting him accurately. <laughs> That's not an accident that Lewis is quotable. It's not an accident that one of the most popular books of Lewis is the quotable Lewis mm. by uh, Martindale and Root, because he knew how to boil things down and serve it to us. And we go, ah, Lewis was a wonderful communicator. But I think you know that because of this podcast. <laughs> and so what I'm trying to do is saying, what did he do? How did he do that? And so he was holistic. He was intentional. The T of high T, I got that wrong for several years. The, I had, always had it as a T, 
but I used and relied upon the quote that you read earlier in our conversation about being a translator, because he says, all I mm. want was a translator. And that's what I thought, okay, Lewis is this great translator. And uh, my, the very first time I presented some of these ideas, I said, he's a translator. That's what he wants to be. It wasn't until a couple years later, as I continued to read Lewis, I said, oh, no, it's about transposition. And probably of the five, that's the most unique contribution that Lewis can teach us. The sermon that he preached at Mansfield College in Oxford, um, it's published as being in 1944. Uh, new research says, no, it's probably a little later than that. But uh, it's a consummate discussion of transposition. Well, what is that? What does that mean to transpose? Um, itself is a metaphor, which gives you a hint. <laughs> when you transpose a piece of music, uh, I'm a baritone. And if someone tried to ask me to sing the Star Spangled Banner at the wrong pitch, I have to, can you bring that? That's too high. Can you bring that down? Transposition, Lewis said, is always going from the higher to the lower, from the richer to the poorer. And I would add to that, from the mysterious and the numinous to where we are today. So yes, he was a translator, and I see trans, and he talked a lot about translation. But I see translation. I talk about it in the book is translation is a horizontal process, hmm. and it is this word for this word. Hola means hello. Uh, that word means this, but transposition is higher to lower. It's vertical in that how do you describe what it's like to hear Beethoven's Ninth Symphony to someone who's never heard it before? How do you describe uh, what it's like to read the Narnia Chronicles and describe why that has that transposition is, take, is making the ineffable effable? And Lewis used examples. He said, you know, sometimes we don't have, uh, when you make a piano version of an orchestral score, the piano sometimes has to double up on the notes. There are not enough notes. There are not enough sounds, but that's what we have. There are not enough colors. So one of the reasons I argue that Lewis, that we go to Lewis and we find something, Lewis helps us understand the numinous. Lewis, through the skill of transposition, how do we understand this higher? There are not enough words. There are not enough notes. There's not enough music to help understand this God, uh, Lewis does that through his the technique of transposition is visual metaphor. And so he was, I suggest in the book that he was a visual learner, photographic memory. Uh, he often talked about pictures, uh, but it was his process. And, you know, life comes to us in pictures and sounds, not in words. And so we, ultimately we have to translate, no, transpose uh, mm -hmm. life into words. We have to take these higher, richer experiences of life and use mere words. And Lewis, many times in many of his passages to several of his letters, writers would say, you know, sometimes there just aren't enough words. The words, it's not, it's not that the experience is inaccurate or inappropriate. The words aren't there. Transposition is the principle of how do you make the murky and the mysterious clear to those of us who've not yet been through the wardrobe door. And mm -hmm. in that, by taking us through the wardrobe door. He did that through story, through um, metaphor, through the right word, through poetry, which is what the fourth principle is about, evocative. Holistic, intentional, transpositional, evocative, to be evoke. The, the principle I teach my students in my communication classes is this. It's better to get a message out of someone than to put one in them. It's better for you to say, oh, yeah, I need that. It's better for the advertiser to get you to hum the tune rather than just hearing it. It's better. All I have to say is the baby shark song. And suddenly, <laughs> you know, how do I get how do I get you to connect these experiences? Because then that becomes your data. That becomes what that becomes true for you. Lewis was a master at getting out of messages out of us of having us say, that's my experience. I can't, you can't argue with your own data. Mm -hmm. Well, how do you do that? What are the techniques of that? Well, Lewis, through story, through word, 
through uh, one of the one of the ways I argue in, in the chapter on being evocative is the literary technique of in media race, which means in the middle of things. He wants you to sort of figure things out and then go, oh, I've heard you talk to some of your guests about Till We Have Faces is that it finally makes sense the second time we read it. Yeah. Or let me hold off on reading the myth about Psyche until I've sort of, he, he wanted you to have that experience. He wanted you to, he wanted to get it out of you. Mm. That was not an accident. He knew how to do that. He told us about that. And so what I do in that chapter is say, here's what Lewis, here's what Lewis is telling us how he did that. And here are some of the examples of how he did that. And by the way, you can do that too. In fact, you do when you say you just sort of naturally begin to use more analogies. Metaphor is simply tapping the surplus of meaning that exists in something. We tap it so that it comes out of us. Lewis was a master of doing that. So he talked about, you know, story. It's about not being surprised, but surprisingness. I, I love opera and I go hear uh, La Boheme every time I can. I know what's going to happen. I have a sense that this is not going to be a new <laughs> no, surprise twist ending. Maybe it's going to stand up and break into song uh, and, and live happily. I don't think that's going to, I know it's going to happen. I cry. I don't, I, I guess I just will now know this. I cry every time. I cry every time. Puccini and C.S. Lewis knew how to get those emotions out of me. And it's often about emotions. So, it's about evoking emotions. And it's not, um, what Lewis said is, don't tell us how to feel. Create the scene there and let us bring our experiences to it. And so he talks about that. So what I do in the book is, is document what he did and how he did that. All of this, the scene that I keep coming back to is when the children, when the Pevensies first hear about Aslan, Lewis speaks about their reaction. And it's really speaking about that ineffable joy and whenever I try and speak about my desire for God, I, I always have to go back to the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. I think it says it best. How many times have you read the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? I'm going to give a conservative estimate of about 30 times. Right. And the reason you do that, David, is because you, don't, you haven't forgotten what happens. Nope. But it evokes within you something of joy that makes us feel that way and makes us feel thankful and praiseworthy when we, we know what happens when the stone table cracks, but we know that's not the end of the story, as Paul Harvey used to say. We know there's, and it, Lewis, you know, he talked about being rereaders and experimenting in criticism. Let's judge books not by anything else, but of how people respond to them. So we read books over and over and over again. I'm going to go to La Boheme again. I'm going to hear Beethoven's Ninth Symphony again because of what it does for me. Not because, oh, I wonder what that's about. Uh, I wonder what will happen here. No. We, we consume them because, and Lewis knew how to paint those pictures, pictures, visual. He knew how to help us hear the tinkling bells on the sledge of the queen. He knew how to do that because he did that by describing things rather than saying, you should feel this way. Now aren't mm -hmm. you sad? Now aren't you sad, children? Now aren't no. No. Uh, so we read it again because you want to feel that way. And that's why he sold 100 million copies of that book, because he, know, he, knew, that was, he knew how to evoke. It's better to get a message out of someone than to put one in them. He knew how to get that out of you and me and the millions of people that still want to hear them and read them. And the reason he was so good at all those principles, the reason he was holistic, intentional, transpositional and evocative was because he knew his audience. Mm -hmm. The A of high T, the final principle. He knew us. He was a student of us. Now, there's not evidence that he took lots of courses in psychology, but he talks about psychology and, you know, he would, he, he understood what it meant to have a slip of the tongue and who, uh, Sigismund was in the Pilgrim's Regret. He, he, so he was aware of those, but, uh, some people say screw tape letters. What a masterful study of psychology. Lewis knew us. Lewis knew us. He knew his reader. He knew his listener. A and in communication, that's the most important thing. Of all the things you do in communication, 
It's not about me. It's about what is it that I can say that helps you. Lewis knew that. And so, yes, he would talk about himself. Uh, but I, I begin chapter uh, two about Lewis as a master communicator saying, Lewis would hate this chapter. <laughs> Just hate. He would probably, you know, don't put that. He, it's not about the speaker, the author. It's not. It's he would not want it to be about him. Uh, he did write his autobiography, so maybe he wasn't completely a purist in that respect. But nonetheless, he would say an experiment of criticism. Don't focus on the author, focus on the book itself. He knew how that would how it would resonate with the audience. So that last chapter, uh, one of the things I really enjoyed or had fun with was was finding all the examples I could find of Lewis being a bad communicator. And there's several. My friend and colleague Bruce Johnson has done an excellent job of finding times when Lewis was less than effective. Uh, George Sayre writes about those. Uh, others of his students talk about when he was when he didn't quite hit the mark with communication. Um, so how does that bolster my argument that he was a master communicator? What I suggest is he learned from that. He re- he knew sometimes when okay this is a bit too abstract. I need to get. I can't just tell them how to feel. I need to get it out of them. But chapter nine, or chapter eight, rather, on audience, I've enjoyed talking about uh, Lewis as a bad communicator. Uh, so if you want to find out examples of how, <laughs> how Jack uh, was sometimes not the great communicator, I talk about that. But he learned from that. I mean, both in his relationships with other there are people who adored Lewis, some who did not. Hmm. Some who said he was you know, he just wasn't very kind sometimes. And some of his students, many of them gave him great praise. Some didn't. Well, but what was that about? I, I talk a little bit about that. What can we learn? And what did he, what did he learn from his less than stellar communication experiences? Um, so what did Lewis say about communication? What's the first, how would I answer my own question? I would say he was holistic. He was intentional. He was transpositional. He knew how to get m- evocative messages out of us, and he knew his audience. What did he do? What were his techniques? The last chapter, how to communicate like C.S. Lewis. What do you do? How, what, are the, what are those techniques? So uh, chapter nine concludes the book with, here's some practical things. Here's what to do. If you, and, and some of the techniques relate to whether you're, if you're giving a speech. Some of them relate to just if you're listening to someone. You're listening on a podcast to some communication professor ramble on about his book. How could <laughs> how can we better listen to somebody who's who's pontificating about something and it, it may not be going over very well? But how do we do that? Lewis had some things to say about that. So in chapter nine, uh, that's how I conclude the book with Lewis's advice. For, uh, let's make this practical. So uh, so Lewis C.S. Lewis, I argue, was a wonderful craftsperson when it comes to communication. He knew how to communicate. How so? He was popular and still is. People still want to hear him, whether it's we want to read him or sometimes we want to hear his voice. We want to hear the audio version of the book. And we can because he was holistic and he wrote that way. And so we love it. But, he, but also he was very practical. He, he, Lewis, the teacher, would want to irrigate our deserts when it comes to communication rather than cut down jungles. He would want us to nourish because human relationships. What did he say? There are no ordinary people. <laughs> he loved people. He loved connecting with people. And he caught a glimpse of the beauty of that. And uh, I, I believe he figured out how to express some of those celestial ideas implicitly. Lewis no, wrote no book about these principles, Lewis would be probably very startled. Then what? Five principles? What? I'm, I'm what? High tea? <laughs> uh, no. This is simply one college professor who stumbled upon C.S. Lewis by first reading a biography, for good or for bad, about him and sort of realizing, what an interesting fellow. Perhaps I should read him. And I did. And the result is C.S. Lewis and the craft of communication. And um, I, I think about the book, going back to my music days, as um, uh, I, you take courses in music appreciation, where you have someone tell you, Let's, here's how to listen to Dvorak's New World Symphony. Listen for this. I think of my book as Lewis appreciation. The, the one purpose of my book is to better appreciate Lewis's genius as a communicator. So reading my book 
can help you understand what is it about Luke? Why, why do I read? Why do I reread the Narnia Chronicles thirty times? What, what, what helps explain that? Some people even go to great lengths to still collect his first editions <laughs> because of his ability to touch our hearts and our minds. And, and he was, I argue, a master communicator. And it strikes me that your book will allow us to enjoy him in another way, in the same way that we look along and we look at, that we contemplate and we enjoy. This will allow us to recognize what he's doing to us as he's doing it. Yes. And at and along is simply another way of being holistic. Hmm. And he said, one's not better than the other. Is it better to be imaginative or reason? Nope. He said, well, you know, we must stop this browbeating and we must both, you know, we must stop privileging one over the other. And that's what I, I hope my book, um, I'll be interested to see if, if its purpose is um, to share with others what I've been thinking about and what I find about Lewis from my uh, communication perspective. Uh, I hope it's helpful. And so I offer it as uh, some ideas to help others appreciate Lewis and Tune in to Pints with Jack so we can find out more about <laughs> we have faces and the great divorce. And, and, but this gives a framework for understanding why do we do that? What is it about Lewis? And I think there's some other lessons. I have one more book that I'm thinking about, and that is what do these principles teach us about God and communication? Mm. That's very interesting, because my next question was going to be, do you have any other projects in the pipeline? And as soon as you ask that question, I start flipping through the genres in the Bible that we have didactic, we have law, we have poetry, we have romantic, erotic poetry, we have gospel, we have visions. There, there are, I, I, I think I've also given a talk where I've looked at screw tape letters and I thought, OK, if these are effective principles of communication, can we find screw tape doing just the opposite? And I believe I've documented that screw tape does just the opposite of high T. And so that's another project is to kind of tease that out. Uh, so I'm looking forward to sharing and, and, but I'm just looking forward to the research. I want this to be, it's been a conversation in my head and with my students. I'm just interested to see, is this helpful? I hope it is. I offer it as, is this helpful to others? to enhance their enjoyment, uh, Lewis appreciation. Uh, this is not about me, but it's about Lewis. And Lewis would say, this is not about him. It reflects upon the source of all joy that he writes so beautifully about. And this book is designed to help us understand, how did he do that? Mm -hmm. And how can that help us uh, better appreciate the source of all joy? And uh, that that's my... That's my intent uh, in terms of being intentional about doing that and writing this book. So I really appreciated the chance to visit with you and share these ideas. And I'm eager to hear ideas from others as the, the book should uh, be out in April and be available through all the usual uh, sources, Amazon and Barnes and Noble. And it's published by Peter Lang and will will be out in April. So it's been a pleasure. Well, it's been fascinating. I can't wait to get my copy and start digging into it. And we'll have to get you back next season because next season we are doing the screw tape letters. So we'll have to bring you on to talk about screw tape the communicator. Yes, he he does. Um, I didn't know if I'd find it, but I found, and, and I won't tip my hand at that yet, but I found there's another acronym besides high T that I will unveil at the appropriate time. Uh, but it provides some convincing evidence that screw tape was masterful in a diabolic opposite way. So the acronym has to be coffee, right? <laughs> <laughs> Dr. BB, thank you so much for sitting down and chatting with me today. And as we draw things to a close, could you just tell us a little bit more about where people can find out more about you on the internet and just remind everyone where they can pick up the book? Yes, the book is available through Amazon and Barnes and Noble and other outlets. Uh, mostly, if you if you put in Stephen A. BB in Google, mostly you'll find a lot of the textbooks that I've authored over the past forty years with uh, several co-authors. Many of them, many of the best ones, I co-authored with my wife Sue. 
we we both met on the college debate team. We both talked about writing books together before we were married, and we've continued to and we continue to write books. And so uh, you can find that information on me on on the web as well as on various book uh, sources. Wonderful. And as usual, I'll include links to everything in the show notes. And listeners, please join us next Tuesday when we're going to have another After Hours episode, this time with Brenton Dickerson from A Pilgrim in Narnia, when we'll be going further up and further in. Cheers. Cheers.